So for those who don't already know who you are, could you tell us who you are and what it is that you do professionally? Well, my name is, uh, is Henrik Wilberg. I'm uh, a professor of German <laughs> at Miami University previously and University of Minnesota, a couple of other places. So that's perhaps where the, the, the uh, idea comes that I'm more of a, I guess I'm more of an itinerant scholar now, but that's how it goes. I am a scholar of, of literature and philosophy, which is, I'm not sure how much that has to do with, with the whole menswear thing, but a little bit, it is a certain approach that I take with it. But, uh, so that means I, yeah, I, uh, teach college classes and do research, at least used to do research in, uh, different parts of the world, uh, up until, you know, two years ago, uh, and, um, has sort of labored in sort of relative obscurity as younger scholars often do. Um, but I'm from Norway originally. So I lived in quite a few places. My studies have taken me to different places. We'll probably come back to that. I've lived in Vienna, Paris, parts of Italy. Uh, I went to graduate school in Chicago at Northwestern university. Uh, I have spent time at uh, Ivy League campuses in the Northeast. I spent time in California, not so much, but a little bit more in California. And I've lived uh, in many parts of the Midwest throughout my sort of uh, short-ish still academic career. So I lived in Indiana, I lived in Minnesota, I lived in Missouri, and now in uh, in Southern Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a very interesting academic history. I also have a degree in philosophy and also in literature. Oh, so nice. I have a bachelor's degree in philosophy, master's degree in English. And so I do want to spend some time talking about perhaps the connection between those things and style, because I think that there, there likely is a connection, <laughs> at least in the sense of just having a broader general appreciation for the past. I do want to come back to that. But for now, yeah. I was really curious about your Instagram. There's a lot of very interesting passages on your Instagram. So I noticed, for example, in your, um, your name on Instagram, you have the, I believe it's a quote, but I might be wrong. Why we remain in the provinces. And I also noticed that you use that as a tag for your photos. So what is that an allusion to? Uh, it is quite obscure. I'm not sure this is going to be like super interesting to everybody, but, um, I mean, it, it has two ways. Like it is a reference to the philosopher Martin Heidegger, the famous, a uh, German philosopher of the early part of the 20th century famously was a Nazi <laughs> for a while, which is perhaps not the best, you know, thing to start with, but every, that's what everyone knows about Martin Heidegger, but he's also the most um, widely read existential philosopher from the early 20th century. So this sort of the good with the bad, you know, this one with the traditions, not to get into that whole can of worms. Uh, but uh, there is a very famous essay by Martin Heidegger uh, called uh, why we stay in the provinces or why we remain in the provinces in the depending on how you want to translate it and it's just him getting offered a job in Berlin at the center of the academic world but rejecting it explaining his reasons why he doesn't think philosophy can be done in Berlin vis-a-vis -vis where he actually lived which was in the small city of Freiburg and in this little hut in the Black Forest so it's sort of a rejection of the city and for me the way i use it is, is more of a joke because i i would obviously have preferred to stay in the city <laughs> but my i got an academic job in minnesota so um that's where that came from this sort of rather jokey embrace of provincial pattern but there is a small point to it namely that um uh at the current moment there is like a, a corrective sort of way to to refusing to be right in the middle of things. I mean, that's not for me. It's not been by choice. I've I've bounced around places where, uh, unless your career forces you, maybe you would not choose to live. I've it's much much less fashionable to live in like Indianapolis, Cincinnati, um, and uh, and Minnesota than it is to to. Uh, that's not what you associate with menswear. Hmm? Um, so th there is a, uh, so when I did, when I did the Instagram that way, uh, it was sort of, uh, an obvious 
sort of jokey rebuke to the urban centered New York centered uh, or London centered uh, menswear scene that I that I found something I couldn't be a part of even if I wanted to because I don't live there but basically probing that angle a little bit is there is it possible that in a at a certain moment um in uh, 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 sort of in our historical moment is it possible that there is sort of a sort of a rural or provincial corrective to the mainstream i mean we saw a little bit of that during court people were trying to leave the cities people were sort of reaffirming um sort of uh, uh or at least that very fantasy of escaping the city and to have like more to slow things down etc i'm not really a part of that type of traditionalism at all but uh, for me it was yeah it was an angle to which to approach these things because all the photos i took was you know taken in a rural in a provincial setting so it's kind of an answer to your question <laughs> but, <laughs> i see um yeah. <clears throat> So could we explore that just for a second? I know that you yeah. said that it's probably not the most interesting part, <laughs> but it's fascinating to me. What connection do you think there is between the provincialism and style? Like, why would you choose that as your name? Yeah, the, the, the idea of the provincialism, the, what, what Heidegger also says in that essay is that basically there is um, uh, at a certain moment in history where um, um, the being in the midst of things is more conf it's uh, more confusing or less conducive to clarity of thought than than uh, than than a withdrawal. There, there, there are certain moments in in history of thought, history of all kinds of things that sort of when a, when a certain kind of withdrawal is actually more radical or more avant garde, you say that that you can say than than being sort of in the midst of the coolest thing right now. And for me, I think that is not wrong. Uh, you've I, guess, seen, I, I apologize for interrupting, but I yeah. guess what I'm angling at here is I'm trying to understand the connection between that, between provincialism and style. Like you have a style page, so why specifically, <laughs> or how does that pertain to style, I guess? It's, style is a difficult part. It certainly has been done, if you think about, um, if you're th thinking about food culture in the last decade or so, that has definitely been happening where people are, where a lot of uh, great new restaurants, for instance, are not in New York City, but are like up in the Hudson Valley or so pretty much withdrawn from um, from uh, from the urban centers. You have to actually travel to, to go there to eat the food and so on. So the 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 impetus in cooking for for a good few years has been closer to the resources or closer to those things um, that make up the very fabric of things. So, um, and uh, You've seen it throughout art history quite often where artists will withdraw from the city and then do their actual creative work outside. And I see people in like even tailors, people in clothing that are that are that are leaving the city and finding um, a way to reconnect with certain things uh, why, uh, in a more provincial setting. Uh, part of that is because uh, um, a lot of American cities are at a breaking point in terms of cost of living. And so this is kind of an economic question. Would this, now a lot of people have asked this question. I think it's true. Like the, for at, a, at a certain moment, um, the cost of living in a place like New York city is just an, an incredible burden. If you want to be creative or have any kind of space, creative space to explore something, you actually have to withdraw from from something like that to if you want to open yeah if you're a sous chef at a big restaurant in new york you can never open your own place you have to go to indianapolis to do that i know and i have noticed in the last few years when i'm living in these places people my age younger a little bit older who are from the midwest and um and these rural places return uh in order to uh, because there simply is a uh, not feasible to pursue what they want to do there in terms of style it's an open question huh? there isn't uh because these places that i've lived don't have really much of a men's scene at all it has a couple of uh, interesting vintage sellers usually or one or two stores that will carry 
um, um, certain brands that have broader acceptance in menswear. If you want to get a good pair of jeans, there's like maybe one place in Kansas City you can go. <laughs> well, there's one place in 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 uh, in uh, Minneapolis, and uh, not more. And it's very so. Uh, but there, uh, if you we're gonna go on to Ivy style in a second. But you know, a, a lot of these classic styles had, of course, a lot a much larger spread. So uh, when you're interested in vintage clothing, for instance, there is an advantage. You can much more easily find certain things in, um, in say, Missouri than you can in, uh, in on the East Coast, for instance, in terms of certain classic menswear component. I've had quite a good, good luck with that. So, uh, But I, I feel I have to disappoint you in a sense that there isn't like a consistent philosophy of a provincialism in style that I can, in good faith, advance at this point. Because the truth is, style is terrible in the Midwest. Uh, <laughs> it's all, it is much, much worse. And just spending a few days, just in, even in Chicago, which is not great, but even like a few days in New York City is just a completely different planet in terms of style-wise. Here, you will almost never see anyone uh, uh, looking interesting in almost any way. That's very, very rare. Uh, so there is not much to defend. So for me, it is, it remains a polemical angle. It's probably true for a lot of things except for style, but my, what my uh, Instagram account maybe wants to say, like maybe, you know, what if like a provincial account is possible? And what would that, and I think my Instagram is a contributor to see what would that look like? You know, style that's out of place in this, in this way. You know? uh, and at the very bottom of that is of course, that I am not at home in this country. I'm in a sense, you know, uh, I've started to think about it as a sort of self-imposed exile of, almost by now this has been a quite long um and doesn't that make you technically an expatriate well i'm technically an expatriate but exile is a more dramatic way of putting it because it's sort of that, <laughs> that puts away right? that there are like there are external reasons for why it's not entirely of your own volition mm. right uh which it sort of has become by now i'm not sure you know uh and um the idea that you know i am on a little bit out of place, and which leads me to the second tagline in my Instagram, maybe. <laughs> I like American, and America likes me. So, where did you uh, get that from? Yeah, of course, it's another. This is what happens on social media. It's like very much a. Uh, it is a direct reference to something fairly obscure. Uh, this is for the German artist Joseph Boys. A couple of people have put this question to me on Instagram. What does it mean? Uh, Joseph Boys is. Uh, uh, an avant-garde artist from the 50s and 60s in the post-war era in Germany, famous for for sort of radical experiments in in art that are now sort of kind of cliches, like very famous for smearing like large amount of butters in a corner at the museum. <laughs> it's one of his most famous radical. installations. It was well, in Greece, yeah. um, this type of stuff. But uh, you can watch on YouTube his video project, I Like America and America Likes Me, which is... Um, and sort of an orchestrated kidnapping where he is being brought from from uh, from Germany to New York City, and he is basically put wrapped in a blanket, and he never talks to anyone in the U.S. He's brought sort of wrapped under a blanket on the plane, brought out immediately, put in a taxi to uh, a gallery in New York City, where he spends uh, two days. With under the same blanket with a, with a cane poking out in a cage with a coyote. Seems dangerous. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can see the whole video on YouTube. There's no real, uh, it is, there's some interesting. So the, it is a very bizarre uh, art installation um, where uh, you can draw your own conclusion as to what Joseph Boys wanted with this. For me, it is so this sort of absurdity of of cultural transfer, this idea um, that um, uh, while America in its in itself has all these um, uh, um, uh, self-professed commitments to diversity and so on, when you come come to it from the outside, it is uh, a bit like encountering a monster in this <laughs> in this sense. Um, it's funny. 
I, I encourage everyone to, to, to look it up on YouTube. I like America and America likes me. Um, but of course, when people see it, I think they make very, very strange connotation to it. I'm not sure if I like America and I'm not quite sure if America likes me either. <laughs> no, that's, that's not true. I do in fact love, like America. And this is sort of what a lot of people have said, like as usually academics who work in the American sphere don't spend really any time in America outside of like large cities or the East coast or something. Whereas I have part through personal connections. Like my wife is from the Midwest. So I've, been everywhere i've been uh everywhere around the midwest and i visited almost every state in the country and every small to mid my city even so it's been like a project of mine so i've been to omaha cedar rapids uh springfield missouri <laughs> anything you want wichita kansas anyway you name it i've i've been there yeah, it's a know fascinating what the travel like. history. So <laughs> has it been your experience in these uh, smaller towns that America likes you? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but I got to say, it's like, it, I do absolutely prefer the coastal elite company to the Midwest one. But this is my have been has been now my lot in life. So it's not. Uh... <laughs> well, one way or another, it's a badass saying, I have to say, because I found I, I uh, recently purchased a Ralph Lauren uh, vintage American flag T-shirt with the 13 stars on it. The T-shirt and, uh, or the like, actual sweater? It's a T-shirt. Yeah. Oh, damn. I, got, I think I'm going to get sweater. Once once I get my citizenship, I'll probably get sweater. Yeah, I think I've seen a sweater on there, but it was like 100 bucks. And I was too broke at the time to get the $100. Yeah, yeah. They're, 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 they're out there. Yeah, they're they made a lot of them so yeah you can you can trawl ebay for them. yeah i was wearing it around the house and i just found myself i told my girlfriend she's like why are you wearing that you look like such a dad i was like because i like yeah. america and america likes me <laughs> <laughs> yeah no no I, i'm actually i'm fully on board with this i mean that's a lot of i actually really dislike this sort of um that it's not cool to like this idea you know that America sucks. It's all built on um, this sort Impressive of uh, systems. Yeah, yeah. This this idea. This is sort of sort of a this is sort of what happens if you take like one college class or something. You know, all this is true in a certain sense. This sort of you can see sort of traces of this in like the sixteen nineteen projects and this type of this type of approaches to American history. That is sort of this approach to history as just like a continuing disaster that America is this this. Uh, uh, and that's not wrong <laughs> in the sense that that um, all of these atrocities, America has been the vehicle for for historical atrocities and this type of things. But what is much more interesting is that that uh, to to look to look at American history as much of our history of of hinge points where things could have gone very very differently. You know? And there there are America contains a lot of counter histories. And one of the reasons that I travel so much around the country is to explore some of these things like the weird the weird communist communes of southern indiana in the 18 in the early to mid 1800s and stuff like that all this sort of exists pockets of other things that are not part of the canon of american history i think it's not very uh useful approach to history to sort of to, to, to sort of uh, judging it in this wholesale manner the more appropriate version is to sort of see that, yes, history is this series of contingent things that ended up in this way. And if you want to understand history, you have to go back and see where things could have gone different. And that that in fact is an afterlife or a continuing presence of things, of other possible avenues in American history that are still with us and can still be taken maybe further down the line. I do believe that. Yeah, I understand the, <clears throat> the position you're articulating. It seems like there's a general disdain, often, I would say, a severely unnuanced one, perceiving America merely as oppressive. And as you said, there's certainly yeah. a part, there are parts of our history that are absolutely horrific. But we as a country, like one way that we could tell our story to ourselves is that we can, you know, recognize ourselves as just being wholly and unnuanced. 
oppressive, or we can look at ourselves as trying to, as best as possible, eradicate ourselves from those systems, which I think is a much more endearing way. And perhaps, I don't know if accurate is the correct word, but more endearing way to look at our country. But I think there is, as you say here, kind of a general disdain for patriotism. So, you know, wearing a shirt with an American flag on it might at this point in history anyway, be kind of looked down upon by certain people. Yeah. And I, and I think, yeah. Uh, Ralph Lauren is a good example of this in the sense of this sort of what does in fact look like kind of an uncritical embrace of like every American tradition ever. <laughs> this sort of unironic, un, there's no sort of, there's not a shred of critique or ironic distance or anything in Ralph Lauren, which is interesting because we live in an age where there is this sort of unconditional embrace of pretty much anything at all doesn't really happen. doesn't really have a space in the culture. Everything is sort of distanced in this way. And I think part of Ralph Lauren's sort of enduring appeal is that he sort of, he offers sort of an, an exit ramp from that type of cynicism that people do tend to cloak themselves in whenever they address, you know, uh, uh, politics or history or sort of there, if any type of the American moment that, that a lot of people, you know, yeah. Uh, I think America suffers from too much of all these things, like too much history. Of people often say that American don't have history or that, or there's a, or there's sort of a sort of ahistorical or ignorant of history. I think actually the opposite that, uh, Nietzsche has put it this way on there is possible to suffer from too much history in a sense of allowing it to overdetermine the way you look at things too much. It's sort of a, a reaction against this sort of complete ignorance. But uh, this sort of overdetermined uh, where history becomes this sort of uh, uh, crafted into your own kind of fate. That's not great. It's not a great way. And it's not because it's not, uh, um, it's politically impotent. It says that that is not a, not a way to conceive of the future in any, in any good way good sense. You have to ask that question. Maybe I'll get in trouble for saying something like this as a, someone who's like vaguely identifying with certain leftist causes often, you know, it's a, if you're not patriotic in a certain sense, then what are you exactly? It's a, it's a, <laughs> it means that you don't believe in like a political future and it ends up to a kind of nihilistic view um, that is not great. Yeah. yeah. You referred to that Nietzsche referred to them as antiquarians. Is that not the correct designation antiquarians is one of the antiquarians is one of them where, where history becomes this sort of obsession into the point of uh crowding out the present uh there is also the other one of yeah the, uh, of uh of um uh being so overburdened by history in the sense that it also inhibits any kind of thinking about the future so that everything becomes fate in a certain sense is that America always becomes determined by what came before, uh, which is sort of a, a, a sickness that historians sort of contribute to culture, uh, which is funny uh, that historicism has its limits there. At a certain point, you do have to leave history behind. And uh, Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's useful this man in moment, uh, in the sense that remembering everything and commemorating everything and embracing everything uh, is um, uh, a burden too great for like the, the human imagination that it, that uh, you have to be in favor of forgetting a few things. <laughs> it's provocative, I should, but people should think it should give that a ser the serious con consideration it merits. I see. So with history in mind, I think we should transition yeah. to talking a little bit about your personal history yeah. with menswear. So I wanted to get a sense of how it is that you got involved or interested or passionate about menswear in the first place. And then I wanted to spend a little bit of time because your style does have a very, very, very Ivy bent, which I love very much. I uh, spent a little bit of time talking about how you became specifically passionate about that style. Yeah, I thought about this for a bit, um, namely how what this journey has been like, because um, I'm not uh, sure I sort of, uh, the, I've sort of been taken a little bit aback by the, the growth of sort of the Instagram following. And that's, this is such a thing I just did. 
in order to alleviate boredom uh, when pandemic struck and so on. It was like a lot of people did, but I had one before, but it wasn't really, uh, it was just a way of maintaining a diary and get to have something, have a certain routine to do every day. But my journey goes, goes way back. There is a long history here that, that I've only recently come to understand as, as just that, as a proper development. Um, I mean, where I grew up in, in Norway in the late nineties, like early two thousands, it's, it was not a environment that was conducive to developing a style of any kind, really. Um, I mean, there were some things around at the time that are sort of come back again now with the nineties revival and everything, but not something I look back upon very fondly. There was never that much in the family. I think my brother was a skater and so on. So it was a little bit like that, a little bit sort of crept in that way. Um, but there was, you know, very little that I look back on now that was sort of part of a style journey for myself. It was more, you know, the usual sort of teenage uh, way of navigating the demands and expectations of your peers as a very sort of classic story. But, you know, I never felt at home in any of the sort of pre-coded subcultures that were available at the time, which was like, yeah, broadly a skater culture, sort of 90s hip hop Wu-Tang gangsta style, which was very much um, in vogue in Europe at the time as well. It's often, often overlooked, I guess. Um, Tommy Hilfiger jeans and such. Well, yeah, but people forget often that exactly what, um, how broad and how quickly that, that, uh, that appeal. I have uh, vivid memories of, I had a friend who was like deeply into like uh, cash money records, like a master P and this stuff down in the, and we, people would order these like videotapes. So I, mean, I distinctly remember it, like my teens sitting in, in my friend's house, watching like these homemade videos of American rappers from the South, just like shooting guns inside their house. That was very, <laughs> that's like the coolest thing you could probably you, you, could, you could imagine uh in retrospect master p is not the greatest of 90s hip-hop there. <laughs> but you know it's most that's, definitely gangstar yeah gangstar yeah gangstar was like a little bit earlier yes yeah but i remember that sign as well yeah big L. yeah big L yeah 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 i mean yeah so uh but I have like the specific ones when I moved to Vienna in the early to th- in the early to mid two thousands. It was like a my first sort of encounter with European style, uh, the sort of classic. I didn't know this type of existed. I have a very sort of clear, vivid memory of of uh, being a student going out to like the bars, getting drunk, uh, and partying, and walking back home, like you know, several miles back home to my uh, to my apartment. And I would go through the city center of Vienna and there would be these old school menswear stores. I think one of them is might still be around still, but that was like the last gasp of the main shopping area in downtown Vienna being independently owned. And you would see these like Hungarian made shoes or even, even bespoke shoemakers. And you would see these like insane shoes. I've never seen like a, like a Budapest style shoe before. I think that's a, that's a reference that listeners will understand. It's like, uh, it's like a specific style of like a brogue shoe. That's like, very, has, has very strong connotation. It's called a Budapest in German. You can look it up, but it's, it's like a very, very classic shoe. Um, it's like, a, I had no idea these type of things existed. Um, and, um, but, and then, of course, I had no money to pursue anything like that type of style as a student. But there were, you know, a few things that I that I acquired in this sort of classic style, like a Burberry trench coat or a couple of a uh, uh, couple of a uh, couple of uh, uh, some Italian knitwear or something that I acquired. Um, and perhaps I had a reputation in college for for dressing up a little bit, like a certain in that in a certain way and i didn't that but that was an italian style which was sort of where vienna was oriented towards back then not so much like the english stuff that all of that stuff came later but uh i lived in italy for a while as an exchange student and sort of and that was when sort of i noticed that like the the um, 
the wealth of craftsmanship that uh, Italian made clothing still had and it was on display every town every like little town in Italy would have these like exquisite stores that were very small that would have incredible shirts incredible incredible shoes incredible knitwear um, no matter how small the town was there was always one or two or three purveyors of this like exquisite very expensive Italian made clothing and then I would go to like Florence and Rome and see sort of the bigger, better known Italian brands. So, but that definitely left an in, in, uh, impression on me. So it was all of these things that I sort of absorbed. I bought sort of approximations of some of these things whenever I could without, without that much success. Uh, and when I lived in Paris later, that's sort of when the, when uh, it really dropped sort of the, 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 then I saw uh, remember similar experiences at, late at night, walking home from, from dinner with friends over in bars, walking across the Place Vendôme is where Charvet is. You can see the whole thing there. It's incredible. It's like one day, I think this is sort of the, 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 the style that I would like. It's like, this is something, um, that is just staked out as a possible destination. I know now that these kind of exquisite things exist in the world. And I think I would like one day to, to approach it in some way. Uh, and yeah, uh, without, I could say that much <laughs> success at the time, but um, um, same with English stuff. Uh, there was a particular one store, like it was, I think it was called like old England a legendary Parisian store that would have all the classic, they would have like, um, uh, especially all the English shoemakers were, were represented there. I saw like trickers uh, shoes for the first time. And I thought it was the greatest thing I ever saw were these like brogue trickers boots, you know, um, um, sort of as a poor student, although um, I did because of the way um when you're on like research fellowships and stuff works as a student before uh, you get paid in advance. So basically you get all the money you'll ever, you're, you're getting for like six months gets paid out in advance. So at a certain point you have money in your account, you can afford some very extravagant things if you budget things out correctly. And I would do this. There were things I, there was things I bought, uh, um, um, particularly in Italy, I bought this like, uh, tan leather like Chelsea boots that were incredible and I wore them for seven or eight years after that but they cost probably the equivalent of what was then was probably around $400 then which was I still would really love to know what the maker is I have no idea but there was some small small craftsman in, in Florence I think and a couple of things like that I bought like a few exquisite things that I then wore for a very very long time um until they fell apart pretty much. Um, uh, and that was sort of my way of negotiating that, that, that type of journey. Um, and it's only now in the last couple of years that I've sort of through vintage through a couple of other ways that I've been able to sort of recapture that, uh, European, uh, classic menswear dimension that, uh, that I always associated with, with my, with as, as my style. So it's when we get to Ivy, that's like, I've approached it in this type of back or roundabout way that the, the actual sort of gold standard from a very young age was this uh, sort of expensive, exquisite materials in the old European way, but not in the fashion way in that sense. Like the, I remember in Paris on the left bank, you see these like older, older gentlemen in like in, in cashmere sweaters and this like para boot comfortable shoes, thick corduroys that are like probably cashmere from like Charvet or something that cost like $900, <laughs> but worn very, very threadbare and thin. And that was sort of, this is incredible. Silk scarves, this that type of particular style. 
of like old Parisian men would would uh, would uh, would wear around the Montparnasse and all the way down to the Latin, not actually in the Latin Quarter where people actually don't look great at all, but a little bit further up, um, uh, you would encounter these guys, um, and that was sort of the real romance. Be like, yeah, this is for me what I what I would like to approach, um, and. Uh, yeah, it was only when I, you know, uh, as it does happen, like when you get a little bit more income and so on, where you can finally make some of those choices, then that's where uh, that's where I sort of try to get, trying to get back to, and I'm still sort of perhaps on that journey. Yeah. When did you uh, immigrate to the United States? Two thousand eight. Okay, so that would have been the year that I graduated high school. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but I, I moved back a couple of years actually, so it's it's uh, it hasn't been quite ten years altogether. Back to Norway? Uh, uh, no, back to uh, I bounced back and forth between between Germany. I went back to Paris for a year. Uh, it was sort of uh, I had was a visiting scholar in different places, so it doesn't quite add up to ten years in the U.S. I think. I haven't I done see. the math. <laughs> well, I actually did do the math for the green card, so it is around 10 years, yeah. I see. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about like your personal style and its Ivy influence. But before we do that, I want to spend a little bit of time trying to get your sense of what Ivy style is. So to you, and you don't have to, of course, give any sort of textbook definition. I'm not sure that there even is one. But what is your sense of Ivy style? What is it? Well, uh, I, I can put it, I can answer the question sort of autobiographically and sort of how I uh, encounter it because uh, in a way I've realized this sort of after the fact that the way I approach Ivy is kind of a, a, a sort of a, a parallel to how Ivy came about in the first place, namely as a transfer of certain items from uh, like an English context to an East Coast American context, like the transfer of the of uh, uh, British knitwear, tweeds, etc., to from uh, from uh, uh, from Britain to the the Ivy League campuses of the East Coast. Uh, so that that sort of uh, my own transfer has also been from within this sort of. Um, European sphere that then gets transferred to America. And I didn't understand this at the time when I encountered, when it was articulated for me as Ivy style. Um, the way it worked for me was that when I lived in Chicago, was in graduate school there, when I could not really afford to buy new clothes, I, I got more into the vintage scene in Chicago and purchased, you know, tweed jackets, Shetland sweaters, and so on through those, not really knowing that that was sort of a, it has certainly had an academic vibe. I was not aware of it as a, as an articulated uh, Ivy style at that time. Uh, but it was what was around. Uh, it was only later that I sort of its codification sort of became clear to me. Like this, like the tweed jackets I bought then were not three roll two. They were like standard two button ones. I didn't know the difference at that time. But they were Harris tweed jackets. That was what I wanted. So sort of this uh, this traditional scratchy, uh, very practical. It was practical stuff because I could wear them pretty much every day. It was great in Chicago. It really fit sort of that that uh, uh, mold of how Ivy like Ivy style came about. Namely, uh, I just moved to this country, so I don't have a large wardrobe. I have to rewear these sweaters and shirts again and again. So I I would sort of my life was sort of very much like the Ivy, the Ivy style, the formative Ivy style, sort of the strictures of Ivy style, namely you don't have a washer dryer in your home <laughs> and you, <laughs> you don't have a lot of money or not, not, you don't want to spend the money on clothes. So you have a few items that you wear again and again. Uh, so I had, you know, that was, yeah. Uh, uh, so later, so it's only later that it sort of came that uh, that the synthesis sort of sort of happened. Uh, but weirdly, because I'd spent time at uh, some Ivy League camps, and most most I spent some time at Princeton. People did not, of course, in the late two thousands, early two thousand tens. 
Nobody at Princeton dressed in anything that's recognizable Ivy style. There were some older professors, University of Chicago too, older professors that were still wearing those type of tweed jacket and expensive shoes and so on, that classic English style. Um, but not many. That was definitely the old guard. Um, it was not uh, not really any, uh, uh, something that you could recognize at all. Um, in fact, people are dressed much better at Rutgers down the road from, than Princeton. That's still true to this day. Princeton people look like shit. <laughs> if you take the tra- if you take the train down to Rutgers, uh, uh, that's uh, in New Brunswick. That's where you get like a proper people dress much much better there. <laughs> I would much much prefer to be there now. Um, in fact, yeah, Ivy, Ivy League campuses today are are bad in that way. I've not been to Dartmouth, but I spent time at pretty much any Ivy League campus, and it's it's not good. <laughs> Not good. So you said something interesting there, which I think speaks to your style and what I love most about it. You have a kind of, to use the Italian word, I may be using it incorrectly, but a sprezzatura, where you have this kind of nonchalance, but it seems like a disciplined, if you will, nonchalance about what you wear. And it seems to me like you've come to Ivy style in a very, very backwards way. So you mentioned that you were first very interested in the Italian dressing. And then um, you started incorporating other items into your wardrobe. And it seemed like you were dressing Ivy before you even knew what Ivy really was, technically speaking. Yeah. And maybe I should spell this out because I have this conversation with people in Mensa that are a little bit younger as well. There are two things that are maybe unique in terms of my style journey. One is that it didn't involve the internet. (laughs) It didn't involve the internet. something I was like, that's actually weird, even for someone who is uh, a millennial, even like an older millennial like myself, which still is still uh, a little bit unusual that the internet was not the avenue, which I, it was never the case for me that I discovered Ivy style as an articulated thing online through inspo. Uh, what I of course had was like inspo, as we call it today, you know, in, in a different way. I've, I mean, I've, I've, um, I was surrounded by, you know, uh, like older academics wearing tweed jacket and corduroys and so on. That, that I thought that was like a, a, a good look. That was sort of, that was part of the, of the um, sort of collective style uh, mind palace, you know, way, even before, even without the internet, that's how. So it was through absorbing it pretty much directly, huh? like finding Harry's tweeds in like thrift stores in Chicago, like feeling it. And this is exactly what I want. This is better than the other things. It was never an online experience for me. And I'm a little bit hesitant to see that that's, that that's sort of, that's the way to good style or something, but there is something to it in a sense that, um, uh, I think a lot of people who are younger, are basically robbed of this phase that when you're, when you're looking through or, 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 uh, experiencing style, developing yourself when you when you're constantly comparing yourself to things on the internet it's not the best way to to uh to uh acquire this type of Voice. real experience in material in the in the, with the material so on you have to that's a, um there's a concept in 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 like american pragmatics from like william james that's the idea of a continuum of experience that the way you build knowledge about the world is not by uh, absorbing like abstract concept that comes to you from without, but it's by ex- extending your, your empirical sphere until it touches the thing that you would want to say. That's like a proper philosophical approach in pragmatism that you, it, you it's bottom up rather than top down is a crude way of putting it, but it's basically is, uh, you learn about things by extending what's already there. If you're comparing yourself to something that's completely outside of that, um, that you cannot touch in a certain sense, and almost in a literal sense, then you're always, uh, you're always sort of struggling to fill out the gap, so to speak, instead of a steady expanse of what you would like to do. I mean, there's plenty of sort of pedagogical philosophies that are, that are about this. There's this, 
Um, I want to make sure I understand what yeah. you mean there. It seems yeah. like generally what you're saying is that if you're learning how to dress through the internet and you're trying to find your own unique voice, if you will, your own personal style, what's been able to happen because of the internet is that you skip out those intermediary steps between where you are and where you're going. Do I understand this correctly? In a way, it's, I think it's more correct to say that those intermediary steps are different. Those intermediary steps are sort of already seen as this sort of things that will always fall short of what you, what you want to be or what you really want to look like. So, um, because that's already, then every, then, yes. Or, or your developmental style becomes very sort of an economical trade-off or as you see very often on the internet, people trying to like game the system, <laughs> like hack it. Like this is the way you acquire the correct kind of basics to get you there in the fast way. This is sort of, tech thinking influence that has sort of infiltrated a lot of the men's were seen as well, that you can, that there's a shortcut. No? I see. Uh, so, or, or to have the rules articulated for you so that you don't make mistakes along the way. Basically people want it to be laid out. Uh, and this is sort of, so all the guides that you have and so on, instead of uh, an approach where you uh, encounter something that is uh, that you for which you already have to find or relate to something that you already do or already have. And um, which is why people often feel like uh, there's a lot of discussion about authenticity, like in, in menswear, right? That, uh, and the internet has in a way had this sort of influence that every, to a certain extent, people feel like they're doing costume or like the costumey, specter of style is always there that people are not at home in their clothes even if they spend a lot of money or a lot of time trying to do it there's always the fear that uh it doesn't look right that it's it it, it look that it's fake like if i wear cowboy boots it doesn't that's not right i'm pretending to be someone i'm not which is kind of a universal experience in a world that sort of has been where precisely that type of incremental experience has been has been uh, eradicated and replaced by, you know, all this information that is very easily accessible. But uh, as a teacher, so I can say that, you know, as, that uh, looking stuff up on the internet is one of the worst ways to, to learn about things in a deep way. I'm not saying it, it's bad in every sense, but it really is pedagogically speaking, disastrous if you want to find basically a home in the world stylistically philosophically and so on it really is so i want to make a i don't know if this is a point or a question yeah. perhaps it's a question so it seems if you're if your style if you're gonna how do i put this if you're going to develop a unique style and that style is going to be based on personal experience it seems like you might run into the difficulty, particularly in some parts of the United States where you're not encountering style, at least in a classic sense, frequently. Like I, for example, live in Bakersfield, California, about an hour and a half out from LA. And I do not know anybody who dresses in a classic, classic manner, yeah. if, if that's the correct designation. So I'm thinking, well, if there's somebody who's in that position, and they don't know how to dress well or, you know, correct. And I understand that there's some irony associated there with those terms, but how do, how would they go about informing themselves, but through the internet? No, you're right. I mean, it's not, it's not, a, it's, there's a danger here of like, that this is like a prescriptive way um, that this is sort of how the way I came to style is, 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 is even available. But what we know as you know, like if you're of the millennial generation, basically it's impossible now to like reverse engineer your own upbringing that way. It's, you can't, there's no real reason to be, which is why I'm not a Luddite in that old sense that tech is bad or the internet is bad or something that is in a way, a version of that sort of, that kind of thinking that wants to consider like America bad or something, this idea of this sort of wholesale rejection, because there is, that's only makes sense if there's an alternative and there is no alternative to the internet of style now. So you're absolutely right. I mean, 
and that has been a revolution. We should not underestimate it. It's true. Like if you, if you grew up in the middle of nowhere before the internet, you're, you, you had zero chance of, you have to, you know, order magazines through mail order and stuff like that. I remember those days a little bit. That was like, it was incredibly difficult to find things. Uh, so uh, you have to remember uh, that today really is still like the best of all. It's the best time. Ever. It's always kind of the best time ever to develop style because you have much, much more opportunity to, to get hold of things and to work through things. Um, uh, just in the way that even if, you know, cinema or film is not in a good place right now, it's still the best time ever to be interested in films because you have the whole back catalog of everything. You have access to, to a lot of the things that you would not have access to before. Uh, there's no room for need for despair. There is no other way to relate to it now that that's not, that it's now a fact of life, but an awareness of what's gone missing is precisely what is needed. I think that you do need to seek things out, uh, uh, in person when you can, um, and to yeah, slow things down and to have more, uh, intentional relationships to the things that you wear, but that is almost impossible to prescribe as especially, you know, when you look at someone who is 10 years younger or something that is just a completely different, uh, different thing. They can become experts in Ivy style in a couple of days on Reddit. You can do it, but that is not the same. And I know this from, you know, when, from teaching other stuff more like philosophically <laughs> uh, textured things, you know, that these shortcuts are harmful uh, even in the medium term. Uh, that that the, the time it takes to develop those relationships is very hard. But I don't think that there is a way around it. I'm absolutely convinced that if I was if I was a teenager like or, or in my in college now, that is exactly exactly uh, what I would do. But there is throughout I mean you can see it that there is this sort of uh, experience expanding notion of sameness in architecture it's true like you know if you go to indianapolis to a coffee shop in indianapolis it looks like in the world it looks like it looks like uh, uh that everywhere this sort of neutral space and the speed of trends now huh? is is breathtaking in that way that even when i still to this day i mean it depends a little bit of where you go but i lived in vienna in paris i spent time in rome naples and it was like an incredible difference in the even in the late 90s early 2000s geographically where people live what people looked like like where you live where you grew up determined your style to an incredible degree there was nobody in Rome who looked like they lived in Paris or vice versa. Huh? Didn't happen. Among younger people, possible. there was, you know, more, it wasn't possible. You couldn't get the stuff. There was a little bit among younger people. They were like more like, but every, every uh, country had its own twist on it. Like, you know, famously like the discussion around French Ivy and what the hell that is. It's, it, but part of it is that you couldn't get the actual stuff that you saw and wanted to get so you had you had local versions of it popping up everywhere um like the paninero style in milan and the sort of 80s version of sort of italian mod or italian sort of uh italian ultra like soccer fans culture all that stuff all that's had like regional inflections a bit like dialects in terms of style that really has disappeared it's a, i mean if you go to paris you see it in older generations but it's very very close there's a there's a vintage store that's fantastic that opened up in oslo in, in during the pandemic where i spent a lot of time they sell the exact same stuff that you can find in a vintage store in milwaukee huh? uh, or or like a uh, more famous one like wooden sleepers or something they sell the same kind of ll bean stuff the vintage uh, sweatshirts with like Wichita State on it or whatever, for some reason that is now sold in Paris, in London. <laughs> and that's been just in the last couple of years that has started. So this, this, uh, there is a danger that this 
that that the speed to which which sameness spreads. Uh, but you see that throughout the culture, like where the the idea, even in for instance, when is the last time? A, a musical artist emerged where where they were from was foundational the way they sounded. I mean, rap music is still true, I think, but but only vaguely. I mean, there isn't that big of a difference between like um, 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 the latest rappers from Atlanta or Chicago. They sound very very similar. Um, so even there, you see this sort of nivelation. We see that, yeah, where you're from no longer matters in that way. So the internet is the actual cultural space. And um, we live in a moment where I think a lot of people are trying to recapture a certain sense of place in what we eat, in what we drink, in how we think and so on, but not really being able to. And I think style has will perhaps follow suit, but... I'm not sure how that, what that would be like, you know? What do you think that that's a, perhaps is the incorrect term, but what do you think it's a reaction to in our current it's definitely cultural a, moment? Because what kind of reaction are sort of possible to this type of pervasive sense of sameness? Um, um, it and, seems like for a lot of people, it's been a refuge in the past, do I understand this correctly? Yeah, refuge in the past. Yeah, one way is like a, a full sort of trad approach is sort of a, a, a sort of a bad answer, but understandable one to this to this problem huh? that you see, that you you reject <laughs> reject modernity. Was me like reject modernity, embrace tradition yeah, in this time? Yeah, <laughs> and that that is like a real thing, and and it you can make fun of it or so. I mean, it is funny, but it responds to real felt need that that uh this type of wider spread in distinction in 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 style is and uh is is felt as a deficit so people want uh uh that type of uh or people um long for or at least maybe in food it's clear like the, the vehicle like the locally sourced and all that that type of that vehicle for consumption is is, is like all conquering in that sense but even there that's like kind of the same everywhere you know? um and style can only do that or it can sort of double down it can sort of accelerate the trends which we have seen like this sort of micro trends um i'm not going to download tiktok ever but this is i see that this is the vehicle where like i hear from friends who say like that uh, and as a trend it can sort of spread and exhaust itself within a matter of weeks or even days and so you can just become this sort of explosion um, um and you know that type of chaos is understandable but it's not you know there's no uh, uh there's no solution to this unless uh, we change the actual infrastructure, what's going on. Maybe this is where I've out myself sort of has a, which is sort of a, a certain type of Marxist view of things. Namely, so there is a material condition for these, for why these things happen. It does not matter in many sense where you live anymore in a very sort of specific economic sense. The reason for anything being where they are have disappeared. They've been undermined economically, socially, and politically. Um, and when that infrastructure disappears, it's very hard to rebuild it or pretend that it's not that it's still there. Huh? Um, um, you know, the reason why uh, our work lives looks like it is, is not because we have, you know, decided for that to be so, but because the entire anything that tied economic activity to a place has been obliterated by the revolutions of international capitalism, its supply chains, et cetera. Nothing belongs anywhere anymore. Anything you buy travels around the world two or three times. We know this now. We still haven't kind of realized it in an existential way, I think. But anything we buy is now sort of is completely deracinated, doesn't have any connection to where you buy it and how you consume it. 
And that is going to cause sort of a cultural crisis and the reactionary responses that we're seeing, you know? What do you think? <laughs> that is my explanations anyway, of what is going on. I would posit something. I don't know how accurate this is. I'm still a novice, very much a novice in menswear, but it seems like there could be an element of culture exhaustion. So because we don't know where we are going, we take refuge in the past. And it seems like this has been, I, I've been speaking with people who are involved in menswear industries. For example, I spoke with Stefano Cal, who is an Italian tie and accessory maker. And I was asking him about the future of menswear. And he was suggesting that part of what's going on now is there's this return back to the past because we're kind of creatively exhausted. And so you'll, you're seeing more and more people, you know, shops opening up that are offering, you know, bespoke options, which was something that was much, much more common in earlier parts of mm -hmm. menswear, for example. So I'm just wondering like, oh, well, is this because we don't creatively know where to go at this point, or there's just so much of everything and it's not, as you've suggested, tied to a particular place. We don't know where to go. So we just go back. I don't know if, if that's accurate, but uh, I seem to have a sense of that. Yeah, you can repeat the last part of what you saw. I heard about the bespoke, the bespoke options that your friend has started to expand into. Yeah, like more specificity. Yeah or, yeah, or that he's he's just noticed this kind of like a current trend in menswear. But I was just suggesting that it seems like because of cultural exhaustion, because we don't know a way to go forward creatively, that we are taking refuge in the past. So, so I get that sense that that might be what's happening in menswear. I don't know what your your thoughts on that are. Um, I'm not sure if it's in the past in a, in, in a very sort of specific sense. I mean, there are, um, like you said, like if you're, if you want something specific now in, in menswear, if you want a particular type of lapel or you want a particular detail, you can now, it's, it's probably never been easier to get it. It's not that long ago where it was almost impossible to find even like even higher waist trousers was like almost impossible to find unless you went like actually bought forties or fifties vintage or something. Uh, and now it's like an option that even mainstream ish made to measure services or made to order services have them now. Um, I think this is, a um, uh, simply a consequence again of, of, uh, um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, because all these places, um, I don't know how your friend exactly is working, but what we're seeing is, like, what I'm seeing at least, it's like there's an ex expansion of options in this sort of middle to upper segment of the market, right? where, where you can wear, but all of these like made to measure things are often made, you know, in uh, by contracting with factories in, if it's in Italy or India or China anyway, right? I don't know how you exactly how your friends work, but um, uh, if we're seeing a return to that, we're, we're actually seeing basically the transfer of those bespoke or bespoke-ish details, like the, like the um, a typical Neapolitan shoulders. You can now, you don't have to go to Naples anymore. You can get it through uh, a made to measure uh, from somewhere else, right? Um, so I, I see more that you actually get a lot of those traditional details now embedded in that system of sameness. That's what I'm seeing maybe. So basically that's to be expected as well. Huh? Um, once, uh, those options become available and that's a good thing, but it's not, uh, I think contrary to the developments that we're, that we are, that we're seeing, um, you are instead seeing uh even more like precisely those details that were geographically specific like the full chest of an english jacket or the neapolitan shoulder is now simply options that you can click on when you order something made to measure mm -hmm. but i don't know that's maybe like a more pessimistic view in a sense that <laughs> that um there's nothing is going to stop this um, cultural deracination of these things. More, instead, more and more specific details are going to wander into the global supply chain and become hierarchized in this way. So you have the option 
<laughs> Whereas earlier you couldn't get it at all. Give me one second, one second. Yeah. He's gonna keep doing that until I open the door and let him know there's nobody there. All right, I know. I have the same. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I got a dog as well, but he's he's fortunately not interested in being here right now. Hey Dan, a, there you go. a western shirt. I uh, I purchased vintage uh, a Levi's western shirt from eBay, uh, and when oh. I received it, it had uh, like they said it was in mint. I don't know what they say, good or mint condition. And when I read the description, it didn't say anything about like buttons missing, but I noticed the top button was an actual pearl mother of pearl button, as opposed oh, to no. the clasping one. So I was like, ah, oh, I see that Spears offering them this, uh, this season. So I'll give it a try. So that's what that is. Yeah, I'm wearing a Western shirt right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, I've had this discussion a couple of times with with uh, people who are in the industry. I know I don't know that much about exactly how the current menswear industry works, sort of top to bottom. But um, I mean, we are seeing this type of this type of development, and I don't see anything anything stopping it. In if anything, it is we are likely to to see a further sort of hollowing out. This is where some of my pessimism comes from. I am a bit of a cultural pessimist, to be fair. <laughs> I think that almost comes with, if you're interested in philosophy or history or something, it's hard not to be in a certain sense. But um, that uh, current trends continuing, you know, we are, go we are about to lose a lot of traditional uh, makers of the things we love. And that's going to happen very soon. I think we still haven't seen the fallout of yet. I remember having one of these moments when I read about the Brooks Brothers bankruptcy, uh, basically erasing 40% of the English silk industry virtually overnight. 40% uh, of those handmade silk ties that were made, they came from the 40% uh, of the business of like the few remaining uh, silk producers in Macclesfield in England was, was selling it to Brooks. And when if the if Brooks were not selling those anymore, they have no chance of survival really, or have to recalibrate, have to change things radically. Certainly, it, gonna have to scale well, down. Yeah, it will remain simply as a curiosity for those who still want it for the very very small producers, perhaps. Um, the idea being that we can, we uh, my 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 theory is is that when you lose basically uh the the upper the upper level mall brands like the middle no here's my dog as well <laughs> when, you, when you lose the when you lose the mid when you use the lose this mid-level uh 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 mainstream and it segments into fast fashion and uh higher end made to measure or bespoke on the other and very little in between is what we're seeing. We're seeing the death of these in between stuff like Brooks Brothers. Uh, I don't know how Ralph Lauren's doing right now. I have no idea <laughs> how the fundamentals are. Um, but um, you can say that, okay, that's good because now people are more intentional about what they want. People know what they want to order and so on. But uh, forgetting the fact that a lot of the things we like, like English knitwear or silk, uh, things like that rely on one like large mall brand that also deals in these things. Um, um, and sort of the interconnectedness of a lot of these materials uh, uh, and these supply chains make it so that you can't separate uh, what we want from what belongs in like a mainstream menswear culture. So if the triumph of athleisure is complete and the eradication of like a mid-level uh, purveyor of menswear like Brooks, if that disappears, you actually also lose the upper level stuff. Yeah. You can't access that stuff anymore. Um, and we know this, like Horween Leather in Chicago is the one of the two makers of like Shell Cordovan, right? Um, they are entirely dependent on a few people who are selling it. If that disappears, there's absolutely almost no rationale. Like Levi's with their salvage uh, operation, right? That was 
one tiny corner of several football fields of of machines. So once you lost the mainstream denim market for made in U.S. jeans, you also lost the the sought after premium product as well because it does not matter. It only makes money if it has a mid level to buttress it, right? I think that is true. I'm going to say I'm not an expert on these things, but I think that is true. I see it in education and ever levels in culture too. If that middle, middle brow segment disappears in literature, cinema, film, and we all get these micro markets that's completely segmented and monopolized by a few operators, you lose the high end as well. You cannot survive as you don't get uh, the good things without this middle brow level, and which is why you know snobbery and mensur is a little little dangerous. Like if you lose, everyone hates on how, what Brooks Brothers has become and something. But if you lose it, you probably also lose. Um, like after Brooks Brothers, like Alden is now basically selling stuff to Japan, right? Uh, they don't have problem selling it, but. If something were to happen with the with the global demand for Aldens for whatever reason, they are not sustainable as a American shoemaker. Pretty sure. If Horween stops selling, because they make the they make the basketballs, right, for the NBA. Uh, I'm not sure to be honest. Yeah. They make the leather for the Spalding balls. I did not know that. Yeah, but this, this is one of those things that is like, yeah, that's this is how it works. I think. Uh, so basically, we get to have shell cordovan loafers because Horween also makes basketballs, in a sense. So basically, if if anything happens to these things, uh, they are so globally integrated and so sort of vulnerable in that sense that they will in fact cease to exist. Um, I don't think like Scottish knitwear will survive another ten years. Maybe maybe a few makers will. It's already like the what's happening to fabric mills in Northern Italy and so on. Just a few giant ones will remain. And I guess we can pick, have our pick of there for our made to measure orders. But uh, in terms of re- retention of that craftsmanship, I don't, I'm not too optimistic. So buy it now. <laughs> so I, I, that is actually a, an approach that I'm following myself. Like, if it's available now, you should probably buy it because um, it won't last. Um, there's a uh, there's a book by a, a food writer called Bill Buford. He wrote a book about Italian food uh, in the 2000s, and it was it ends with this sort of elegiac take on uh, on basically handmade food disappearing. Hmm. Uh, that was written maybe 20 years ago, so 15, 20 years ago. And the message of that book is basically like, there are a few people left in the world with the know-how to do, to make and do these things. And they are all old and they will die very soon. Uh, and after that, there uh, there is no long-term sustainability in in the system. Food will handmade food in the traditional way will disappear. It will be replaced by like celebrity chef appropriations of the same things, maybe. Mm. Uh, And so the, so the, but the the question is, yeah, seek it out while you can, Uh, which is sort of how I approach buying things. Now I buy those things that I, that I don't expect to be here for very long. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's a little bit too pessimistic. So I think that that's a good place to segue because one thing yeah. I wanted to get your opinion on or your thoughts about is the current Ivy collaborations. And there's kind of been, you know, a couple of different frames of mind about this, you know, so we have, for example, Brooks Brothers, I believe last season, or maybe it was this season, they collaborated with Phila, I believe. And then we had LL Bean, they, um, they collaborated with Todd Snyder and most recently J press um, collaborated with Todd Snyder. So what do you make of that? Do you think that this is an attempt on the part of those companies to survive by trying to appeal to a different market of consumers? Like, but what, what do you make of it? 
Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm not privy to the actual, you know, strategic you know, deliberation that's going on there, but it's it's clearly a, an attempt to make it part of a part of a conversation. But I kind of think that uh, for J Press and the traditional customers, are they really going to to uh, to expand their customer base by doing these? I don't know. Uh, it's a gamble that I don't think they have much to lose, to be honest. I mean, how. Um, Todd Snyder kind of pioneered that model in the 2010s, right? That's sort of his, he was the one who, who uh, launched this type of heritage collaboration models with J.Crew in the 2010s, right? And that successful model that sort of, I guess they sort of saved Red Wing that way, I think. I think mean, Red Wing was like a Japan only brand at that point and work were in the US and they sold some weird stuff in Japan and then, think this is how the story is that Todd Snyder sort of roped them in for J crew. If I remember how the story went. Uh, but that was of course in the era where sort of the heritage where was very, very heavy. We're not really in that model anymore. We are now in a, in menswear where the, where sort of the streetwear drop model is, is reigning. That's very different from the, from the heritage notion, I think. So now it's basically a matter of, um, uh um getting uh getting a little bit more mileage out of the streetwear trend while you still can is how my interpretation of this um i'm not a crit critic of that actually in a sense i think streetwear is where innovation has happened in menswear in the last few years there's no denying that i think uh um question is whether it has uh, the mileage in or the or the 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 creative juices left in it to 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 do much more than it already has done. That is sort of street wearification of fashion, and uh, that's how I see it. I don't really actually read it as J Press reaching out to a younger audience. I mean, they are, but I think it's more um, how to. Uh, try to squeeze the 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 lemon of of streetwear for a little bit longer uh, which is sort of the only game kind of left in higher end uh fashion it seems and i do think that has like a i don't see it ending to be to be fair not because streetwear is independently of how good streetwear is objectively right now but simply because there is uh Streetwear is not a trend like other trends that will then come and go. It is kind of like an end stage of fashion, I think, in a sense of um, um, uh, it absorbs pretty much everything else in its path. It's not one trend that follows along another. So I guess we'll see this type of continued streetwear education. Some of it I like. I can't say I've bought anything of the collaborations you've mentioned. But it's it's undeniable. I, it is a an interesting way, like how Amy Leon Doré or these have, are doing these uh, are doing these uh, these fusions of of uh, or merger between the the classic menswear, Ivy style, and and streetwear. There is you know parallels enough there. Um, but I'm afraid I don't have like too much incredibly interesting things or takes on those on those things. I just think that this is just the the model that's available right now to have a small sort of capsule as a collaboration between those things, and you do a New York based photo shoot based on it, and then that's how you go, how it goes. Um, it is also you know an element of sameness that comes there, but. <laughs> I think that's how it goes. Uh, it's no, there's no need to be overly critical about about that. That this sort of a, this is a way of defiling the sanctity of J Press. Something it seems very silly to me as long as those things that go away. Because J, I cannot imagine a lot of J Press having too many customers in college age right now. Uh, but there's also no way that this is going to be a a way to save a brand that way it's just a way of positioning itself while with positioning this brand within a cycle of of uh of streetwear
and they can easily get some some credit points maybe but i don't see that changing too much yeah. and i have no solution that... to it how that would work <laughs> <laughs> what do you think this is going to do for style or particularly ivy style if anything i don't know in terms of where ivy style is i mean i've been it's interesting to see for me for instance like discovering drakes as a brand like maybe five six four or five years ago five years ago was sort of a, a moment for me also to sort of okay this is how the the synthesis of like a lot of european styles and ivy is done right now i found that you know the, the classic drake's lookbooks from three four years ago or something were important to sort of okay that hammers home that message that the journey that i was on was basically sort of caught up with uh, within and and was you know possible you know? um but i don't see yeah i don't see that will that really would change I, I guess i don't have that much investment in like a canonical ivy style enough for me it's actually more of an for me ivy style is not separate from a broader american continuum of style it is one of sort of three sort of quintessentially three or four, maybe quintessentially American styles that I also, I very much enjoy. It's a, the Ivy style sort of Western style and uh, U.S. military style. And all of these have sort of different ins and outs vis-a-vis uh, -vis communications with, with Ivy style as well. So the way I see it, it basically is, uh in the maybe in the mold of i like america and america likes me this sort of appropriation of america sort of while i'm here not not that much different from traveling around the country to see lesser known parts and trying to uncover a sort of different historical dimension of american of american life that you can get by going to you know butte montana or something and see <laughs> and see like where the minor strikes happened and so on this idea of there are for me like acquiring and purchasing some classic american pieces is this type of philological historical work of appropriating um uh, something as as an outsider but precisely through experience and not through um yeah, internet inspiration. This is like a long slog in that sense. You have to, so for me, like classic, classic denim, some classic West, uh, some classic Western wear, um, and especially like acquiring for me, like the moment where for me it sort of it flipped the switch was when I was able to incorporate like military, vintage military stuff into my wardrobe and only then did i sort of get access to the to the sort of later stage more rugged ivy approach of the 70s that i also didn't really know about as a canonical style for them uh, and drake's by adding a lot of those english and even french elements sort of crystallized it for me that this was okay this is um uh, a moment that uh that sort of makes sense for me from depending to where i came from but not sort of as a, I never copied or went directly top down from anything I saw and, and got something. It felt natural to me to, to get into some of these things that has a, that is sort of anchored in American history. Um, which is maybe the weird part. I do actually think that that's more important than personal style. This is my, yeah, I might lose somebody <laughs> in the sense that, we do perhaps have a responsibility towards these objects and the life world that they were embedded in, that we can recall, appropriate, and work through by wearing them. This sounds a bit esoteric, but I, I'm, go for, I'm going for this in the sense that rather than me as an individual subjectively crafting a unique style that I, I then display to the delight of others in social media, which maybe is what I'm doing. It, what, what I'm actually doing is working through clothing sartorial history in a very conscious manner in order to uh, 
yeah, um, get a feeling for like the, to use a metaphor, like the seams of history that can be approached in this way. To me, it's a meaningful pursuit. And I am like a historian of, of thinking and writing. That is my job. And there has been a slight convergence there. Um, like the way you read an older novel or an older philosophical text and you can sort of uh, see uh, and feel in a very uh, deep way how this relates to you, not in the sense of it's that how it sort of equips you to do anything in particular, but uh, that... Uh, uh, allows you to orient yourself thinking, speaking as a dressed being in the world. <laughs> if you could put it that way. I like that. It's a weird way. Being. <laughs> yeah. Dressed being in the world. That's why I, I do think so that there is a, an approach to style that isn't appropriating it for your own subjective good, but you are response, not responsible, sort of responsive to, uh, a history and a life world that precedes you and that you can communicate with in that, in that way. Uh, and that is different from a blind obedience to tradition because mm. that is a reactualization of what, what, of, of what the potentials of each and every garment. You don't wear a, uh, an Ivy style three, two jacket in order to, to assimilate yourself to the the atmosphere of an Ivy of Brown University circa 1963 or whatever. That's weird. That is costume play in a sense. I don't have that drive. I'm not a true nostalgic mm. in this way. What I believe in is that you can that you can have access to these to sort of historical dimensions of the present through uh, through the uh, these particular objects, their garments, and how they relate to things. And no different for me that, in a sense, different only in intensity, like a work of art has a greater scope than uh, a shirt or a jacket, even though how great it may well be. But it's still a repository of possibilities of relating to the world, no matter how you look at it. And entering into that is important. And doing it also with the knowledge and the foresight that we are about to lose these things unless we are able to revitalize it in some way. But in a sense, not about to lose. We have, in fact, I think, lost it already. <laughs> the classic men's in a sense, is gone or a, or a dying period. But what we can do is have a uh, keep it alive or keep, the, uh, keep it alive, keep that space open uh, so that it's not lost, at least as a possibility, as possible relation. And that is a philosophical, somewhat esoteric view, but that is the point that I'm at right now. That's completely fascinating. I think you may have just <laughs> entirely revolutionized the way that I look at dressing. Um, so with that said, with that philosophical yeah. approach to dressing, how mm -hmm. is it that you go about determining what it is that you're going to wear on a day-to-day -day basis? No, that is sort of, um, uh, I don't have a methodical approach. Um, often it's, it's simply based on something that I would like to wear and, and, and explore a bit further. And then I just sort of take it from, uh, take it from there. I do try to introduce a couple of elements that make things, um, um, more difficult or more interesting. I try, for instance, not to repeat things. <laughs> like once an ensemble is done, I sort of, I tend to be done with it for uh, forever, which is a bit odd, but not because I think it's bad to repeat anything on the contrary, but because I, I, I find that the, there's a, it just adds an extra degree of difficulty to things that can make it more interesting that way. Um, we, we can put an external restraint on something. Um, but I don't know, I'm, I think I'm in a, in a moment now where I've, cause since I see we were, I stayed outside of the classroom teaching online and so on for 
over a year, pretty much. And it's only this fall that I returned to the classroom and sort of clothing became more, uh, again, became more sort of bound by, by the social and institutional situations. Um, so there's, it's just, um, uh, I guess a, a period of not rediscovery, but, um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, trying to, uh, to, um, have a sort of clear, more of a clear relationship to where I want things to be. It always has to be better than, than last year. I look at some of the stuff that I came up with last year and say, okay, there's definitely still development going on here. Um, so, uh, we'll see what happened, what might happen. I'm not immune to, 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 to change in no way. So I'm still not done. I wonder if I will be done at some point. Yeah. That's uh, the next question I was going to ask, like whether you're ever going to develop a style, if you know what I mean, like in some sort of rigid sense where you have like, this is me, this is the kind of thing that I wear, or if it's just going to be a continual, you know, transcending. I think I'm closer. I think I'm closer. Um, like for instance, I travel a lot. I would still like to do some more, but I think I do travel in order to be done with it at some point. <laughs> like okay. I do it in order to stop. There's a, there is this idea that, that you, uh, uh, um, that you expose yourself to a, to a lot of things. The younger you are, the greater your level of exposure is. And then when you get a little bit older, things do get a little bit narrower, but more precise. And that is true in terms of my own. I see it in other dimensions, like in terms of other cultural products I consume, things I watch. I become more sort of careful of my time. I am not sort of a, I'm much less promiscuous with my time than before what I used to be. I am, I'm no, I'm no longer like an arm um, cultural omnivore in, in, in any sort of real sense. I'm able to leave things at the side and I focus to, 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 to rereading or rewatching certain things that are much more, that I have a more meaningful connection with while keeping one eye on, on current developments. So I expect something similar to happen, to happen in clothes that I will be done at some point. Um, because I don't, particularly enjoy sort of the, the sort of the, the sheer accumulation and the newness of things is not something that I've ever been particularly fond of. I'm, uh, uh, I do expect that I, I do purchase clothes because one day I will be done. That there is a, that this has like a, an expiration, this project that I've been on more or less for three or four years in terms of, of exploring the possibilities of, of, of the way I want to dress and so on. I think it has a, I think it has maybe a couple of more years in it, but in terms of, uh, of newer acquisitions or trying out different things, I don't think it has that much more, um, in it at a certain point you want to, I think that's good to the way people say some filmmakers keep making the same things all over and over again. I think that's a good place to be. It's not a criticism, of Scorsese or, or, uh, or someone like that. Yeah. You don't have to do, uh, for one, yeah. For, at one point it would be nice to be done. So at some point you'll have <laughs> like a wardrobe. Yeah. Or a wardrobe or at least a point of view that will no longer be susceptible to change. It will just be, mm. yeah, I will, I will acquire a couple of these things and for me, that's always been like, it's not a list exactly, but a few sort of American classics that have been, that have been acquired, acquired in, in a double sense, ones that I've, I've purchased them and found them, but also in a sense of I found a way for the way I think about clothes to include like a perfecto jacket or something, which is, was a bit of so a couple of things that are a bit of a stretch, a couple of things that I have not yet been able to do as well as I want to. But at a certain point, I do expect that to, uh, to stop, but I'm not quite there, there, uh, there yet. We'll see. <laughs> so it's starting to get a little bit late. So I think we should probably, Oh, there we go. We got the light. We've got so the light back. <laughs> um, 
one thing that I wanted to get your perspective on before we do leave is uh, where you think menswear is going to be headed in the next five years. Do you have any sense of where it's headed at all? I mean, there is, uh, they're going to be this sort of, in terms of uh, where things are produced, like the type of type of shift is going to change and it's going to be the pressure on sort of classic European manufacturer is going to be increased. I don't see that relenting in any way. I don't really see uh, that there will be a, a credible counter, like a credible counter movement to fast fashion in the way it'll just be a further segmentation. I do not think that, uh, that, uh, that will happen, but I will see. Like I think, just the 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 continued convergence of things like like you already see uh, with those collaborations that you mentioned, where uh, very casual, outdoorsy, and athleisure will will uh, will spill into. You see, like yeah, uh, like. It's like Amy Leon Dore are moving from sweatshirts into making suits. And then you see J Press or Brooks, Brooks Brothers moving the other way. And you see that that's, that's sort of uh, making uh, tailored clothing will, will sort of merge with the production of, of sweatpants, or whatever, that they will be actually the very same same makers making all of it. So no one will actually stand out or, or have like a recalcitrant view of that view like that. Uh, that's not a prediction that's already happening. I just see that that will be much more pervasive. Um, there's one thing that perhaps we haven't talked about, which is basically the, uh, where things are going sort of cost wise, because Spencer is becoming inaccessible this is like a bit like living in new york like the rents going up like uh and that is a worry for me it's, it's harder and more expensive to get into these things than even a couple of years ago um i just noticed that a pair of like crockett and jones loafers that i bought like last year for you know they were, they were not cheap but they were they went on sale like 30 percent off and still more expensive than when i bought them full price last year mm. Um, so I think, uh, what I'm worried about is something that I've seen, um, in food and in particularly in wine, which is a, another passion of mine. I haven't really let into, but, but wine in wine, you have seen that a few very coveted things have, have basically moved out of, uh, uh, of the realm of possibility. You know? You used, it was not that long ago, like stuff like fine Burgundy or Bordeaux wine was, expensive but it was for someone with a normal paying job it was a possible splurge for a special occasion you could buy it in a wine store for you know less than a hundred dollars you could buy like a top of the line the very best those wines now cost thousands that's not it they've appreciated more than any than any crypto <laughs> or any <laughs> or any any art or any art like all of these things Namely, that is what I'm perhaps I should hammer through for you. Basically, the the becoming assets, the assetification of the entire economy, everything becoming assets in this way, uh, like what has happened to luxury goods in wine, less so in food, but in wine, definitely. And that is happening to menswear as well. Uh, so a few things will just move out of the realm of possibility, like Alden loafers. Prices are probably going to go up 40 to 50% in the next year, I've heard. That takes that out of the realm of possibility for me, of purchasing the new at least. Uh, and uh, I expect that to continue. That's a sad way, basically, that a lot of the best things, the fine things in life that has happened with wine will move out, will be no longer be accessible. And the prices for their replacement will also go up inexorably. Uh, I was going to say, do you, do you think that that's actually sustainable? <clears throat> I mean, if you, you move a product like that to a, you know, a high enough price, you're going to get rid of your, your base. Do you think that there's going to be a point where it's going to kind of level off? 
Well, it is a bubble in a sense, and in in wine there has been a little bit, but there has uh, if if our if the asset economy has proved one thing is that these bubbles are fine. <laughs> like we are perfectly fine. Uh, uh, like uh, Wiley Coyote just walking off the cliff, and just as long as we don't look down, it seems to be working just fine. Um, so a lot of people will be, uh, you know, there are plenty of tailors who are making uh, in Italy, something like making great, uh, making uh, good money on the on some of these things. But uh, things will become terribly expensive. You know? I mean, the 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 that will probably be the biggest change in terms of the greater threat to to menswear sort of as a sort of as a as a style that has a broad base is the same thing that keeps people from becoming homeowners basically that they become investment pieces or assets um you're seeing it you're seeing it more very clear in like the vintage market where things have changed you probably agree is things that were affordable ish just last year have now become extremely expensive. Um, and, um, that is not, you know, um, that's, that's the same thing that's happening to, um, houses that are falling down in a Midwestern city still being incredibly expensive. Um, uh, there are pockets where it's where where things are still affordable, I guess, and things will move around a little bit. But that is unfortunately what's happening. Um, that uh, whenever something becomes or enters into this orbit of asset inflation, uh, there is really no turning back. It seems uh, until the entire economy is sort of has that adjustment, which, depending on who you listen to, might well happen, but. Uh, that doesn't seem to be true. You would like to think that you get that there's a that there's a limit there that you will lose customer, but that doesn't seem the case. It seems to be the case, uh, the case at all. And I've seen like personally my own spending habits have like it was unheard of for me to to buy a vintage item for well over a hundred dollars. That was not something that I would have done even maybe even last year or a year and a half ago, but that does seem to happen now. <laughs> Um, so do you see yeah. generally menswear becoming because of this acidification, as you mentioned, do you see menswear becoming even more rare or classic menswear rather than becoming more and more rare? I think so. Yeah. I think that, the, that at least classic pieces will, will, along with vintage will basically move up several brackets and people who we're seeing some versions of this too, where where wealthier people now buy vintage clothing and, and use them as investment pieces and so on. And I have friends, you know, who do that, and um, uh, that that has become uh, uh, a very common occurrence. Uh, it's good for vintage dealers, at least for now, but um, for menswear as a whole, it's uh, different. Difficult to make that argument, where at least younger people get younger people get left behind exactly like the uh, the housing markets and the question is yeah are there new areas of discovery that haven't been haven't been drawn into this yet uh vintage too is limited in supply we're we're already well like y2k style is back within the vintage circus but after that you you double back into fast fashion anyway so um Fast fashion will not be revived by vintage style, I think, because uh, there is no, I don't see that happening. There is, so we are locked in basically a downward or sort of a zero sum game there, I think. Um, it was almost ironic. It seems like we're going to be back at a place, if, you know, assuming that things continue as you are suggesting, we're going to be back at a place that we started from, which is where menswear was for the elite. That's exactly right. And we'll see this in, we'll see this in all aspects of our culture. I think mm. uh, we already see it in education where uh, the, the transformations of higher education, the student loan calamities and all that is conspiring to, to move 
what we consider a classical college education that involves at least to some degree studies in the humanities is basically being withdrawn from people without their means. So, so the children of the wealthy will, uh, will uh, keep going to the liberal arts schools and do the classical curriculums, while the very same people who send their kids to liberal arts schools will tell everyone else who comes from a less advantaged uh, background to go to a trade school or to get something very uh, practical. That is unfortunately the way the entire culture is built, absent some kind of radical transformation, which is not in the cards, although some murmurs maybe, but there is no way that the way we dress can isolate itself from that larger uh, social economic uh, moment that we find ourselves in. And the, the defining moments for our era is asset <laughs> inflation uh, and um, uh, stagnation of the middle and lower stagnation or catastrophic implosion of the middle and lower uh, middle class. So that is also going to happen. We already see vintage was a product of this. I'm convinced of this. The rise of vintage in the 2010s or, uh, was a direct response to the financial crisis. Uh, but what is a generation that kind of that is becoming poor made vintage cool again? That's not a coincidence. Mm. Same thing happens to all those restaurants serving like uh, serving uh, serving brunch instead of five course meals, you know. Or suddenly, every restaurant, for for instance, stopped having tablecloth when it, you know, uh, that sort of uh, family table style dining. All of that stuff came after the great recession of 2008, when that type of opulence was out of the question anyway, you're not gonna have the plush large lifestyle that was promised to you. So now you make do and vintage and brunch were cheaper versions of what happened before. I think that's very clear in hindsight that, that, uh, that vintage came not through some sort of sustainability that may have played some role in it, but I'm convinced that, that is basically the style of downward mobility, which is the culture we still live in for a large amount. So you get opulence at the top, downward mobility for everybody else. And the style you get from that is what we're seeing. Mm. So we're closing <laughs> in here on two hours. So <clears throat> before we Yeah, go, I hope they don't bore too many of them, but yeah. <laughs> uh, it no. certainly didn't bore me. This fascinated me. Um, so before we go, is there anything you wanted to let the viewers know? Um, no, not in the sense that seek out the things, you know, that, uh, um, that still matter in that sense. The assumption is that the things we love will not be here for that much longer, but while they are here, um, uh, you should take advantage of the same sale. Seek it out, uh, have an intentional approach to how you dress and buy these things. Uh, ensure that it is in the sphere of your continual experience and not something, not trying to conform to any kind of abstract ideal of how one is supposed to dress. So, uh, everything you do should be one or two steps ahead of where you already are, but with an, you know, an eye a little bit further, further down the line. Uh, anything else is, uh, yeah. But it's been more things in life, be more, more intentional about things. I do think that is happening, or at least as a desire for it, uh, given the sort of tremendous cultural bottleneck we've been into in, or pressure cooker as well, whatever you want to see here, we've been on the past couple of years um, that um, we should uh, be more intentional about the things you read, the things you eat, the things you wear and all of these things. And that is not some sort of obli some obligation from a point of guilt, but from a point of discovery you know, to anchor your life world in these things that that are uh that are around you in the sense that they are 
meaningful, not in some sort of deep, not even some, some sort of deep spiritual sense. That is probably not the best idea when it comes to 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 inanimate objects, anyway. But to um, yeah, don't waste <laughs> a good opportunity. You know? Uh, seek it seek out the good things while they are still available because uh, chances are they will be less available tomorrow than they are today <laughs> um so for those who don't already follow you where can they find you it's um uh, on instagram it's uh, h wilberg with a w or why we remain in the provinces uh there is not that much alpha out there. I still think if you Google me, the academic career comes still is on top of the Google search, but maybe for not much longer. <laughs> there's not much, there's not much else, uh, 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 not what else out there, but uh, that is all I have to plug, at least not for now. But <laughs> I'm not trying to become, it, it is, yeah, it is just bizarre to me that if, I never expected it is a generational thing as well. For me, social media has all, never been really a medium of the self. You know, I, I never considered what I, what you put out there as in any way reflective on my real life in any way. Mm. It's always bizarre to me when people make demands of of you based on what they think. You are like, like, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you talking about this? Presuming because you have a minuscule or something of an audience that, that that comes with some kind of responsibility as an older millennial, the internet bears no responsibility. <laughs> internet is anarchy and chaos and is probably, it should have probably been kept that way instead of the sort of monopoly situation it is now. That is also part of the loss that we have experiences, I guess. But uh, um, it is baffling to me that people do care, but you cannot argue against the law of numbers in that sense. So I guess people do. Uh, so I'm always happy. It does, prov you know, provide me with a real source of joy, but not in this sort of the way people talk about social media, about the instant craving for the attention or something. I think I'm just too old for, I don't know about you, but I'm just too old for any of that. It doesn't really affect me. Someone yells at me on the internet. Uh, or calls me a uh, calls me a homeless person, which does have just happen with some regularity, uh, because of the way I look. Yeah, anyway, uh, something like that that does happen a lot. Um, uh, I've never been. Uh, it's not a question even of thick or thin skin. It's just the inter social media is a joke in that sense. But I mean, there are. Uh, it is it is enjoyable to exchange views for style with people. So I'll keep doing it. And I'm happy that so many people seem to enjoy it. Uh, and that's it. I've never uh, tried to, to me, there's nothing there, uh, nothing to monetize, nothing to, to rearrange. I don't think so. Uh, it's just an interesting diversion for the what's for the stuff I'm really doing, which has very little to do with it. But I think that's the healthiest way to approach things. So if you want to give me a follow, I'm uh, always happy to start a conversation, but okay. Uh, that's just that strange. So in any case, I take clothing much more seriously than I do social media, I guess. <laughs> Which is odd because people people talk about dressing for the internet a lot and stuff. I don't even understand that mindset really. Um, I don't really know. I'm just too old to know what for the internet sort of means as a actual audience that is meaningful to me in a certain way. It's not. But <laughs> clothing's are the clothes. Are people always people always like withdraw. It's like okay, I don't get upset. The clothing is. It's not that serious. It's just clothes, man. Have fun. Uh, do what you like. Dress what you feel like. Uh, be yourself. All those are terrible ideas. Uh, <laughs> uh, clothing is deeply serious in that way because it's in the way that they 
they, what they articulate about the world and how we move through it. Uh, I think that much more seriously than, than I do social media. But I've kept enough of your attention. <laughs> so <laughs> no, I'm greatly that be the last word. Thank, thank you very much for coming on and speaking with me. This conversation has been extremely enlightening. I will say you have definitely <laughs> altered the way that I think about clothing and how I'm gonna think about clothing going forward. So I greatly right. appreciate you coming on and speaking with me. All right. Thank you so much. All righty. Well, have a tremendous All day. Right. Have a great evening. Yeah.